in the conversation in my circle of friends who we are all almost all in our 60s and a few people in their 70s. And I find that when to take Social Security is, of course, the biggest question for anybody is when to file for it. But I hear so many people only looking at the break-even analysis. And I just want to encourage people, that is a piece of data that needs to be looked at, but it is definitely not the only piece. This is the single most important fact about Social Security planning for a married couple. When the higher earner waits to file for their benefit, it increases the household's income as long as either person is still alive. And because of that, it is usually just mathematically super advantageous for that person to wait all the way until age 70. There can be some exceptions. So for example, if there's minor children or an adult disabled child or something like that, there are exceptions. But most of the time, it's a very good idea for the higher earner to wait until age 70. So basically, if you're gonna smoke and drink and eat too much and be obese, don't save into your 401k. Take Social Security early because you're not going to need it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the short version, right? And conversely, if you're doing the opposite of those things, it makes even more sense to wait. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to FI together. Hi, and welcome back to Catching Up to FI. This is not normally my job, so I'm sort of laughing at myself about this. So, hello. And I'm here with my co-host, Bill. How are you today, Bill? Well, Happy New Year. This is going to air, I think, in the first week or so of the new year. And we want to give you a couple of calls to action or resolutions this year. Please buy us a coffee. Support the uh, podcast. Uh, you can go to the Support Us link at the top of the webpage. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That helps others find this podcast. We also want to hear from you. Send us a voicemail or an email going through the contact page on the website. And then refer us a friend or two. We're just still trying to expand our audience and reach all late starters that need to hear this message, not just the ones inside the FI community. Now, we have a very exciting guest for you today. We're going to talk about Social Security, and I'm going to turn it over to Becky to introduce our guest. All right. So today we're talking to Mike Piper. Bill first met Mike at the inaugural White Coat Investor Conference in 2019 in Park City, Utah, and recently caught up with him at the Bogleheads Conference in Rockville, Maryland, which I had tons of FOMO about because I didn't get to go. Mike Piper is a CPA living in St. Louis. He's written several concise, meaning 100 pages or less, books dealing with various financial topics and has been quoted as an expert on tax, social security, and other financial planning topics in numerous publications like the Wall Street Journal, AARP, and Morningstar. He's also the creator of the Open Social Security Calculator. And believe me, we're all going to be using that. Mike writes at his blog, Oblivious Investor, Simple, Low-Maintenance Investing. His blog is dedicated to spreading the idea that investment success is based upon stubbornly following a very few but simple principles. Number one, diversifying your portfolio. Two, minimizing costs such as brokerage commissions, mutual fund expenses, and taxes. And number three, ignoring all the noise from the financial media about what the stock market does from day to day. And I think those are great rules to follow. In other words, if your portfolio is properly set up, it's okay to be oblivious to much of the financial media and most of the day-to-day -day happenings in the market. So today, we want to chat with Mike about Social Security. This topic, along with Medicare, is looming in the future of many of our listeners. It's a topic that feels complicated and hard to understand. In fact, today, we'll be covering topics from his book, Social Security Made Simple. And we are so happy, Mike, that you have simplified this for us. Mike's going to break down the basics for us today. We won't cover every topic in his book today, but Bill and I want you to have a primer and a place to start in your understanding of Social Security. Then, when you're closer to that decision time, you'll know what questions to ask and where to find the answers. 
this will be one of those episodes that you'll want to take notes, rewind, listen again, and definitely check out the show notes. In fact, you're probably going to want to put this one on normal speed. All right, Mike, we are so happy to have you here today. Welcome to Catching Up Defy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's awesome that uh, you're willing to talk to us today. This is a complicated topic for me personally because I'm not there yet. I'm in the planning stages of it. I'm 58, as uh, I want folks to remember. My wife is turning 60, and we're coming up on this decision, and it is a significant part of my financial plan being a late starter. Becky, where are you with Social Security? Well, I am taking mine. I took mine at my full retirement age, which we will have that explained to us in a little while. For me, that was 66 and four months. So I waited until that point and took mine. Stephen is waiting until 70, which is the, the oldest that you can wait and or delay taking it and get the benefit. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. He's waiting until 70. All right. So, Mike, we want to start by quoting a portion of your book in the intro. And quote, unfortunately, it's common for retirees to make decisions regarding their Social Security benefits that cause them to miss out on tens of thousands of dollars or sometimes even a six figure sum over the course of their retirement. Assuming that you anticipate Social Security benefits playing a meaningful role in your retirement finances, it's important for us to understand how the system works and what you can do to get the most out of your benefits. Just like taxes, you want to minimize those and maximize Social Security. It can make a year or two's worth of expenses difference, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a decision that you only make once, right? As opposed to many of the financial decisions in our life that we're making over and over. This decision, we make it one time. And the nice part about it is it, it takes some research. You have to do some learning, but the implementation of it is very, very easy. Whereas many other financial decisions, you have they're ongoing work. This one is not. So you do a little bit of research, make your decision, and it can have a significant positive impact. And so Mike, can you give us a quick primer on what it, exactly it is? And we'll dive into the details, uh, including what are the historical origins uh, and how does the original intent and scope differ from today? Yeah, so social security when it started was uh, just retirement benefits, basically. Uh, today, we've added on any number of different things. We've added on benefits for spouses, uh, which interestingly, the benefit for wives came along first and then separately the benefit for husbands later. So we've also added on benefits for surviving spouses. We've added on child benefits for adult disabled children or minor children. It goes on and on basically. It, it started out as just the basic retirement benefit and uh, it's been expanded significantly since then. Now we're also worried about the fact that the trust that governs Social Security is going to run out in, I think, 2037. So what's what do you think, this is a crystal ball question, what do you think, I mean, is it going to run out and what would the implications be or is the government going to find a way to fund this? And if not fully, what are the potential options for what happens at 2037? I mean, firees would worry about this, right? Yeah, so the, the first thing to know, a lot of people when they hear the headline might say social security is going broke or social security at risk of being depleted or, or something like that. And what a lot of people think that means when they read that headline is that social security is going to go broke and go to zero. And that's not what we're talking about here. Instead, there is a, a trust fund, a pool of money that has been built up over many years because for many years, the taxes that people were paying on their earnings exceeded the amount that the social security program was paying out. So we were accumulating this pool of assets. And then as baby boomers moved into retirement, that the balance is flipped. So now the program has been paying out more than it's been taking in for several years. And so the trust fund is winding down, but even when it gets to zero, so that would be if Congress has absolutely nothing and the trust fund does eventually hit zero. It's not as if the program goes away because there's still ongoing tax revenue coming in every year because there are still people working. And the projections are that the ongoing tax revenue would be enough to pay for about three quarters of the promised benefits. Uh, the trustees report varies a little bit from year to year, so it might say 73% or 77%, but very roughly three quarters. So if Congress did absolutely nothing, the this is the absolute head in the sand approach, completely ignore the situation. 
the program wouldn't go away, we'd see a, a cut in benefits of about one quarter, which of course would be very significant for any retirees reliant on that income. But it's a big difference between that and Social Security is going to be gone in 10 years, which is what some people think is what we're looking at. I think that's very comforting for a lot of people. And I, I want to make sure that they really take in what you just said, because in lots and lots of conversations, we hear, I'm not going to, it won't be there for me. I'm not going to put it in my plan. It's all of this sort of doom and gloom type attitude, which obviously has been propagated by the media. And for the folks in our audience, I think Social Security is going to be probably a significant part of their plan. And it should give them some hope and some comfort that it is okay to include that in your future planning. Yeah, absolutely. I emphatically think that including a zero there is much more pessimistic than is necessary. That, that would require an unforeseen thing happening. That's Congress not just sticking their head in the sands, but abolishing the program, like writing new legislation to do that, which frankly would be not very popular. So it would, no. it would be hard to imagine that being passed. Right, right. Okay, wonderful. I, I really appreciate you explaining that for us. All right, so we're going to start working our way through your book, Social Security Made Simple. So at the very beginning, you talk about who can take Social Security and when do you qualify. So would you break that down for us? Sure. So the first thing is that you need 40 quarters of coverage or 40 credits. And the amount, so you can earn four credits per year, which is why sometimes we refer to them as quarters of coverage, but you don't actually need to earn them in calendar quarters. For instance, if you worked enough in January to, of a given year to earn four credits, you would get four credits for that year. So the number for 2024 is $1,730. That's the amount of earnings that you need to earn one credit. So if you earned four times that amount in 2024, you would get the maximum four credits that you can get for the year and you need 40 total credits. So most of the time that means you need 10 years of earnings in order to qualify for a social security retirement benefit. The other thing is your age. You have to be at least age 62 in order to qualify for a benefit. Or actually in most cases for most people you need to be age 62 and one month. But the general idea is 10 years of earnings and age 62 in order to get a retirement benefit. You talk also about in this chapter to be eligible or entitled. And can you take us through the differences there? Yeah. So these are two terms that when plain English, the way that we speak casually, you would use the terms interchangeably. You would say, oh, I, I'm entitled to a benefit. I'm eligible for a benefit. And in Social Security's writing, those two terms are not the same thing. And so it's important to be aware of this distinction. So if you're reading an article on SSA.gov, you understand what they're talking about. So eligible means that you would qualify for a benefit if you filed for that benefit. So for instance, for a retirement benefit, as we just discussed, if you're age 62 and you have 40 credits, then you're eligible for a benefit. Entitled means that you are eligible for a benefit and you have filed for that benefit. And that's so basically it means you're receiving a benefit in most cases, although sometimes you can be entitled, but then something else happens to mean that you're actually not receiving a benefit. But entitled means that you are eligible and have filed, whereas eligible just means that you're eligible. And so that distinction, again, it's important whenever you read anything from the SSA to be aware of it so that you're not confused as to what exactly they're saying. So for most people, this runs in the background of their lives. It's kind of like this hidden engine that they may not pay attention to. And they're actually running a balance. They may or may not know it because they're not logging into the Social Security website. Can you tell us how do you, quote, sign up and why is it so important to log into your account? Yeah, so ssa.gov slash my account, although they've changed that URL periodically from time to time. That's how you create an account. That's where you go. And you'll have to answer some security questions, as you might expect. And then once you have your online social security account, that is helpful for a couple of reasons. Number one is that it can be useful for identity fraud prevention, because once you have created that account, nobody else can create that account in your name. And that's a good thing. 
The other thing is that it lets you view an estimate of what your benefits might be if you continue earning at the level that you're currently earning. And it lets you look at what the Social Security Administration thinks is your earnings record. And usually all of those details are correct, but it's worth checking because every once in a while someone will find that there's a year where the SSA has a zero and they actually did work that year. And so if you see something like that, it's important to go find some documentation of your earnings for that year, whether it's your W-2 or your tax return or whatever it is, and get in touch with the Social Security Administration so that you can pass that information along to them and so that you'll actually get credit for it when you get your ultimate Social Security benefit. Great. And like you said, I would suggest that everyone do that no matter what your age is today to go set up that account. All right. So the next thing that we want to talk about is how retirement benefits are actually calculated. And I don't want to dive too deep into this, but I do want to give folks uh, an understanding of what does SSA.gov do with your earnings history? How do they determine how much your payments are going to be? Sure. So to dig into this, there's two pieces of jargon that we really can't avoid. The first one is full retirement age. And that's just a particular age that depends on the year in which you were born. Anybody born 1960 or later, their full retirement age is 67. For people born before that, it's going to be a little bit earlier. And so that's all that is. Full retirement age is a particular age, and it depends on the year in which you were born. And then we have your primary insurance amount, which is the most jargony piece of jargon I've ever heard, your PIA. And what that means, it's the monthly social security retirement benefit that you would get if you file for your retirement benefit exactly at your full retirement age so just to repeat that this is your primary insurance amount your pia and it's the size of the monthly retirement benefit you would get if you file for your retirement benefit exactly at your full retirement age and there's a lot of math that goes into your pia and we can go ahead and dig into that now if you want Sure. I I wanted to make one point real Mm -hmm. quick here. When we started, we were talking about you are, and let me see if I get the word right, is it eligible to take your benefit at 62? And -hmm. now we're talking about 67. So just to give folks an idea, there's going to be different ages in these conversations. Not Mm -hmm. everybody has to take it at 62. You have a choice of between 62 and 70. But so I just wanted to sort of clear that up. All right. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So your PIA is your benefit at full retirement age, if that's when you start it. But you can start it earlier. You can start it as early as 62, or you can wait as late as age 70. And basically, the longer you wait, the larger the benefit that you get. But step one in the math is figuring out, okay, what would my benefit be at full retirement age? And then once we've done that math, then there's some additional math that we do to adjust that benefit based on whether you file earlier or later than full retirement age. I mean, we're not going to get through the exact calculation, but I didn't know that there was a stepwise calculation. Can you take us through some of those steps just so people understand that it's just not random? Yeah, yeah. So the general idea here, the first thing they do is they take all of your years of earnings history and they adjust all of the years before age 60. They adjust them upward, essentially based on wage inflation. So if in 1970 you earned a certain amount, and it's probably a modest amount because that was early in your career and it was many years ago, they'd adjust that upward into essentially today's dollars. So it counts for more. And after they've done those adjustments for all of those earlier years, they take all of your years of earnings history and pick the 35 highest. And they add up that number. So 35 years of earnings all added together and they divide by 420, which is the number of months in 35 years. And so that result, they call your average indexed monthly earnings. So it's essentially how much you average, you earned per month on average after adjusting for wage inflation. And then based on that number, they apply some multiplication to calculate your primary insurance amount. And this calculation involves what we call bend points. The basic idea here is essentially that the higher your average index monthly earnings, or in other words, the higher your earnings over the course of your career, the smaller your primary insurance amount will be as a percentage of those average index monthly earnings. 
essentially there's a lower and lower replacement rate. Social Security will replace a lower percentage of your earnings the higher your earnings are. And so there's basically, I think, two Ben points. And do you see it as a penalty for high wage earners? I mean, you can characterize it however you want. The, the general idea here is that it goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning, the history of Social Security, where Social Security was not originally intended exactly as a retirement program in the way that a pension would be, for instance. Instead, it was mostly meant to be a poverty prevention program. That's overwhelmingly what Social Security is about. That's why we also have disability benefits and benefits for children of people who, who have died. So Social Security is overwhelmingly about preventing poverty. And so here we're trying to prevent poverty in people's old age. And so that's why they replace a higher percentage of those lower amounts of earnings because it's just kind of a, let's make sure we get everybody up to this level and then we'll give you a little bit more credit for earnings beyond that is kind of the rough idea. And you said the 35 years, a lot of people don't make that, but I assume that if you made the social security maximum for 35 years, there's a ceiling on the benefits. Is that correct? Right. So the social security maximum per year, there's a maximum amount that's taxable every year. So for instance, in 2024, it's going to be $168,600. Any earnings beyond that point within a given year don't count. They're just eliminated from the calculation. And so there is effectively a maximum benefit that any given person could have, because if you earn the maximum every year for all 35 years, then yeah, that's the maximum benefit essentially. And it varies by year because it's all wage inflation adjusted. Essentially it grows along with the national average wage. Um, but yes, there is a maximum benefit that a person could get. Now, important in this calculation or so, and it's very important for Social Security, is that it's adjusted for inflation. A COLA is applied to your primary insurance amount, whether or not you filed for benefits. Isn't that correct? That's exactly right. And this is a common, common misconception. A lot of people are worried. This is one of the most common questions I get, actually, about Social Security. A lot of people think that the COLA only kicks in once they have filed for their benefit, and that is not the case. Uh, it kicks in as soon as you're age 62, you start getting a COLA every year. Your primary insurance amount goes up along with inflation, regardless of whether or not you have filed. So it's not a reason to file early, nor is it a reason to file later, because the point is you just you get that COLA one way or another, whereas a lot of people are worried and they think they have to file immediately in order to start getting that inflation adjustment. So it runs in the background whether you filed or not. Exactly. And Mike, what happens if you worked the 10 years to qualify, but you didn't work 35 years. What if you don't have 35 years of earnings? Yeah, good question. So the short answer is that they still look at 35 years and they just put zeros in. So if you have 14 years of earnings, you've got those 14 years of earnings and 21 years of zeros. And so this is one that does come up a lot. So anybody who common examples would be, for instance, people who were the full-time parent in a household. And so they have a, a large chunk of zero years, and then they went back to work at some point. So they were working before kids and then after kids, but a big lump of zeros in the middle. For them, additional years of work can be considerably more impactful than it might be for other people because they're knocking out years of zeros. Whereas if somebody already has 35 years, then they're still going to be, if they have another year of high earnings, they'd knock out a relatively lower year but it's not as impactful as knocking out a zero from the calculation. So is the worst case scenario, you're single, you don't get 10 years or 40 credits, and you're not eligible, what happens then? That's exactly it, you're not eligible. That's the long and short of it. So if you're in that scenario, most of the time people who are in that scenario are often probably going to be close to 40 credits. A lot of times you'll see people who have maybe eight years of earnings or something like that. And then it often makes sense to try to work a little bit longer to go pick up those last credits. And remember, it's not a huge amount of earnings that's necessary to get a credit. So I had it again, it was $1,730 of earnings for one credit in 2024. You can get that by working part-time somewhere. Just a part-time job somewhere will get you your four credits per year. And if you're a spouse that for whatever reason has a career of zeros because you're raising a family, that's where I guess the spousal benefit 
and the divorcee or widower benefit came from to avoid poverty in that class, whether it's a male or a female, you become eligible. Yep, that's exactly right. So, so far we've been talking about retirement benefits based on a person's own work record, but then there are also spousal benefits and ex-spouse benefits and surviving spouse benefits as well. That's a perfect transition into chapter three. Can you take us into what those spousal benefits are? Sure. So requirement number one in order to receive a spousal benefit is that you have to be married to somebody who qualifies for a retirement benefit. There is also an ex-spouse benefit, and the math here works basically the same way. So if you're not married to them anymore, but you were married to them for 10 years before getting divorced, then you can qualify for an ex-spouse benefit where the math works the same way as a spousal benefit. So that's requirement number one. Either you're currently married or you were married for 10 years or more and then got divorced. Requirement number two is, again, you have to be age 62. And then another requirement, and this is basically just getting into the math, is that if your own primary insurance amount is more than half of your spouse's primary insurance amount, then you don't get a spousal benefit. You're just going to get your own retirement benefit instead. So essentially, spousal benefits only kick in when the person getting the spousal benefit has a much lower earnings history than the person getting the retirement benefit. So what happens if you don't stay married for 10 years? I mean, it seems like that's going to promote hanging in there uh, and the one more year syndrome of marriage. Absolutely. Yes. There are cases where I've absolutely seen people who have recognized that the marriage is not working out, but they decide to stick it out for a few more months or whatever is necessary to hit, hit that 10 year marker. So I think the the situation you just described is probably where I am. I worked enough to qualify. I got my 40 quarters in, but I did not work for 35 years because I spent the majority of that time raising the kids. So I have my own benefit, my own primary insurance amount, but it's going to be less than my spousal benefit. But I can't take that spousal benefit until Stephen files for his benefits. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah. So in addition to needing to be age 62 and either be married or have been married for 10 years, the other requirement is that in order for you to get a spousal benefit, your spouse must have started receiving their retirement benefit. So they must be, in Social Security jargon, entitled to a retirement benefit rather than just eligible for it. The exception here is for ex-spouses. In that case, you can get an uh, ex-spouse benefit even if your ex-spouse has not filed for their retirement benefit, as long as A, the ex-spouse is at least age 62, and B, you've been divorced for at least two years. Interesting. Oh. So you, you can't take it earlier than 62. Is, and there's no way in all of these scenarios that you can take Social Security before 62, if I understand you correctly? Not for retirement benefits or spousal benefits. For surviving spouse benefits, they can begin as early as age 60. Okay. All right. Now, you talk also about deemed filing. Can you take us through what that means uh, in the Social Security jargon? Yes. Deemed filing is... The way the rules work today, they used to work differently, and there's a small subset of people who are still under that grandfathered set of old rules. But the way they work today for most people is that if you are eligible for a retirement benefit and a spousal benefit, and you file for either one of the two, they automatically deem you to have filed for the other benefit as well. So basically, you can't file for just one benefit. If you file for either of the two, you're automatically counted as having filed for both. In addition, if you are currently entitled to one of the two benefits, and then, so you're already receiving one of these two benefits, and then you become eligible for the other benefit, deemed filing kicks in for that other benefit at that time. So it's as if you filed immediately upon becoming eligible. So the way that usually works is, let's say I'm receiving a retirement benefit already, but I'm not yet eligible for a spousal benefit because my spouse hasn't yet filed for her retirement benefit. Well, then 
as soon as she does file for her retirement benefit, then suddenly I become eligible and that kicks in a deemed filing. So I'm automatically treated as having filed for my spousal benefit on that date. But you can't take both. You have to pick the higher one. Is that true? Uh, that's not exactly true. Um, that's a kind of a shorthand way that we often phrase it, but that's not technically correct. The way that it actually works is you get your own retirement benefit, whatever that amount happens to be. And then your spousal benefit is calculated as half of your spouse's primary insurance amount. So half of the other person's primary insurance amount minus the greater of your own primary insurance amount or your own retirement benefit. And so basically a lot of people just think that your spousal benefit is half of the other person's benefit. And that's not technically correct. It's that's where the math starts, but then we subtract your own retirement benefit. And so most people who are getting a spousal benefit, they're actually getting a retirement benefit and a spousal benefit that adds up to half of the other person's primary insurance amount. And I know that's super technical and we're getting really deep into the weeds here. And most of the time that difference doesn't matter at all because the long and short of it is that you get a total benefit that's half of the other person's primary insurance amount in most cases. But sometimes it does matter that your benefit is partially retirement benefit and partially spousal benefit because there are other complicating factors that can kick in that will affect only one of those two benefits. Mm -hmm. And so it is important in those cases to know what portion of your total monthly benefit is actually your own retirement benefit and what portion of it is a spousal benefit. So in a simplified case, let's say that, as in my case, I'm taking my own Social Security now. I did wait till full retirement age. Mm -hmm. And let's say, for example, I'm getting $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And that when Stephen takes his, let's say his is $4,000 a month. Half of it is 2000 which is larger than what I'm getting now. So right now I'm collecting, and these aren't real numbers, I made them up. I'm mm -hmm. collecting my $1,000 a month. And then when he files for his, then mine will switch from that 1,000 to the 2,000, which was half of his primary insurance amount at full retirement age, not half of what he's taking because he waited until 70. Exactly, that was right. the point I was gonna bring up is that we need to start with half of his primary insurance amount rather than half of his right. age 70 benefit. Right, yep. and let's stop and do that real quick about what happens to your primary insurance amount before re full retirement age and what happens to it afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So when you've, again, your full retirement age is typically 67 or 66 or somewhere in between, basically. So for everybody looking at these decisions these days, that's the answer. And you can file as early as 62 or as late as age 70. And every month that you wait, your benefit goes up by a little bit. So basically, for somebody with a full retirement age of 67, if they filed at age 62, that would be five years early. And the reduction, so if you file five years early, your retirement benefit is 70% of your primary insurance amount. So it's a 30% reduction for filing five years early. If you waited, one more year, so now it's age 63. And again, if you have a full retirement age of 67, that's now four years early. Now it would be 75% of your retirement benefit. And then if you waited one more year, it would be 80%. And then it jumps to basically 87% and 93%. So the math changes in there, but it's an increase for every month that you wait. And again, I'm only talking about the years here, but it's actually a month by month increase. So filing at 62 and three months, will get you a larger benefit than filing at 62 and two months. And then you can wait beyond your full retirement age as well. You can wait all the way until age 70. And for every year that you wait beyond your full retirement age, the increase in your monthly benefit is 8% of your primary insurance amount. So somebody who files one year after full retirement age would get 108% of their primary insurance amount. Somebody who files two years after full retirement age would get 116% and so on. And so, so how, how does this compare to, say, buying your own retirement with a single premium indexed annuity? Can you give people an example of how powerful Social Security is compared to that? Yeah. So you can go out and buy a single premium immediate annuity, uh, referred to as a SPIA, and that's basically a pension that you buy from an insurance company. So you give them a lump sum of money right now, and they promise to pay you a certain amount of money every month or every year for the rest of your life 
or you can buy a joint one where they promise to pay a certain amount of money to you and your spouse for as long as either of you is alive. And the payout from those depends on current interest rates. So right now, the payout from those is actually considerably higher than it would have been three years ago. And so the comparison between annuities of that sort and Social Security varies over time because the increase that you get for waiting to take your Social Security benefit has nothing to do with interest rates. It's just written into the law, this is what it is. Whereas the payout that you would get from a, an annuity very much does depend on interest rates because the insurance company knows that they're going to take your premium and buy some bonds with it, basically. And so they know that they care what interest rates are. And so the comparison, again, it changes over time as interest rates change. What you'll often find is that maybe the payout is similar when interest rates are kind of higher, but the big difference is that the annuity doesn't have a COLA. It doesn't have an inflation adjustment, whereas Social Security does. So even if you're buying an annuity at essentially the same price, the one comes with an inflation adjustment and the other doesn't. In addition, one's backed by the federal government and the other isn't. So there's somewhat less risk there. But the, the comparison, it's hard, it's hard to say that this is always a higher payout or that's always a higher payout because it just it varies over time. But in your income stack, we talk about annuities and people think, ah, those are just bad. Okay, mm -hmm. I got to stay away from those because it's an insurance salesman selling me something. But going with that, if you're sort of marginal on your income needs and looking at it around 70, typically, I would say, in can increase your minimum dignity floor, as it's called, with uh, a fixed, albeit, but another level of income stack. And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So we often, I mean, I'm sure anyone listening to anything about retirement planning has run into the 4% rule. And it's the idea that you can spend four-ish percent per year from your retirement portfolio over a retirement that you expect to last about 30 years. And there's a little more to it than that, as I'm sure people will tell you. But 4% is this rough figure that we use. Whereas if you, you know, wait from full retirement age until one year past full retirement age, you got an 8% increase. So that was an 8% payout, which is considerably higher than 4%, obviously. And so the income that you get, essentially, for every dollar of Social Security that you forego right now, so you're giving up your benefits for the, this month that you're waiting and next month that you're waiting and next month that you're waiting. And the income that you get as a result is a much higher percentage than the rate of spending that would be safe from a retirement portfolio. Got it. Okay. Becky, we need to talk about one of our, one of our audience or one of our co-hosts actually is a widower and there's benefits for these folks uh, and they need to know that they're there and they also need to know what impact does that make yeah so moving on to widow slash widower benefits also known as surviving spouse benefits here the minimum age is age 60 rather than 62 so you can get it a little bit earlier and for these and by the way this is also true for spousal benefits they max out at full retirement age rather than age 70. So you would only ever want to wait for a, a retirement benefit until age 70. You wouldn't want to wait for a spousal benefit until age 70 or a survivor benefit unless you had to for some reason. So they max out at full retirement age. But just like with retirement benefits or spousal benefits, with a survivor benefit, the earlier you file, the smaller your monthly benefit. And the math of survivor benefits to put it bluntly, if you thought that the math of spousal benefits is complicated, survivor benefits has at least two additional sets of factors to consider. So it gets, it gets pretty hairy. But the gist of it is that your benefit as a surviving spouse is based on what your deceased spouse was receiving or would have received if they hadn't yet filed at the time of their death, basically. So it's based on your deceased spouse's earnings record. So the higher their earnings record, the larger your surviving spouse benefit would be. And a super, super critical thing to know 
for anybody who is a surviving spouse is that those deemed filing rules that we were talking about for retirement benefits and spousal benefits, they don't apply for survivor benefits. They don't apply at all. And so what that means is that somebody who's coming up on age 60, if they're already a surviving spouse, it usually makes sense to either file immediately for your survivor benefit at age 60, and while you collect that, you can let your retirement benefit keep growing until age 70. And then at age 70, you file for your retirement benefit. So that's strategy A. Strategy B is exactly the opposite. Basically, you file for your own retirement benefit as early as possible at age 62, and you let your survivor benefit keep growing until it maxes out at your full retirement age. And the general way that you choose between strategy A and strategy B, so which one do you file for early, is you file for the smaller one early, basically. You want to let whichever one could grow to a larger amount, you want to let that one grow to a larger amount. Let it max out and file for the other one as soon as you can is usually what makes sense in that situation. So, Mike, your own retirement benefit will grow till 70. Right. And I just want to make sure I was clear on this, but the deceased spouse's benefit only grows until whose full retirement age, theirs mm. or the surviving spouse? Excellent question. It grows, a person's benefit as a surviving spouse depends on their own age when they file for it. Okay. So it maxes out at their full retirement age. Okay. Got it. All right. So in your book, the next thing that, that you talk about is the Social Security for Divorced Spouses, which I think we may have covered. So uh, let's just go through that again real quickly, just high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The math, again, generally works the same way as regular spousal benefits. Okay. One requirement benefit or one requirement to qualify for a benefit is that you have to have been married for 10 years. One other thing to know, though, that's really important is that if you were married for 10 years before that divorce, that's how you would qualify for a spousal benefit. But if you outlive your ex-spouse, you can get a surviving ex-spouse benefit, which is the regular surviving spouse benefit as an ex-spouse. So basically your benefit bumps up whenever your ex-spouse dies is the long and short of it, which creates some strange Agatha Christie sort of murder mysteries in my mind, but I've never actually heard of that happening, but I don't know. It seems like it could happen. <laughs> So, so Mike, what happens if that divorced spouse remarries? Yes. If you remarry, then you won't be able to get a spousal or surviving spouse benefit on your ex-spouse's work record. But now you very well might be able to get a benefit on your current spouse's record. There are some exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. Okay. Okay. So we can't collect from everyone in the picture. No, not at the same time. You, you, so you could have been collecting from ex-spouse A, and then you get married to spouse B, and then collect on spouse B, but you can't collect from spouse A and B at the same time. Okay. But what if spouse A dies? Do you get both? <laughs> well, okay, well, so here we go. So if spouse A dies, <laughs> if, you're still married, if you're still married to spouse B, you can only get spouse B. But if then spouse B dies, or you get divorced from spouse B, now you can choose between A or B. <laughs> Basically, so you choose based on whoever had the higher earnings record. So it, it pays <laughs> it, it pays to have a rich spouse at one level or another to, mm -hmm. to maximize your benefit. So <laughs> if if it's Tuesday, <laughs> <laughs> oh my right. goodness! Okay, so we're having fun with it, but it gets really complicated. I, I just want to point out that a significant portion of our population, or at least the engaged population in our community, are divorced spouses because they've had financial trauma. So it's really important to dig in to this one. Now, we're, we got a lot still to talk about. So I, I want to just mention that you talk about child benefits. They're mm -hmm. out there. Read the book and you'll find out about them. From a high level, let's talk about, and they're going away, but we still got pensions that calculate into Social Security. Can you give us a quick primer on a couple of things with regards to pensions and Social Security? Sure. There's two specific rules that can become applicable if you have a pension. The first thing to know, though, is that it has to not just be a pension, but specifically a pension from work that you did that wasn't 
covered by Social Security. So if you just worked for a business that happened to offer you a pension, but you were paying in Social Security this whole time, you don't have to worry about these two complicating rules at all. You can just ignore them. But if you worked for, for instance, your state government as a, a teacher or you're a, a firefighter or something like that, and so you're working for a government entity where you're not paying Social Security tax, and then you get a pension from that work, that's when you have to worry about these two separate rules. The first one is the WEP, the Windfall Elimination Provision. And the way this works is it changes the math for calculating your primary insurance amount. And we didn't dig into this piece of the math, but we talked about how your primary insurance amount replaces a smaller percentage of your historical earnings, the higher your earnings are. Basically, it just cranks down that percentage somewhat. But the more years of earnings that you had covered by Social Security, if you hit a particular threshold of, of quote, substantial earnings covered by Social Security, then the effect of this, this windfall elimination provision is reduced. So there's a lot of math going on behind the scenes. Uh, if you Google SSA windfall elimination provision publication, they've got an excellent little PDF publication. It's only a few pages long. It explains the whole thing. So that's, that's a great short little resource that'll introduce you to it. That's good but, to know. Yeah. yeah, the very short version is that if you have this pension from work that you did that wasn't covered by Social Security tax, then it's going to bump down your own retirement benefits somewhat. The second rule, the second complicating factor that can come in is the GPO, the Government Pension Offset. And this one doesn't affect your own retirement benefit. It affects the benefit that you might receive as a spouse or a surviving spouse. And specifically, it reduces either of those two benefits by two thirds of your monthly pension amount. And it can reduce it all the way to zero. And so, because the thing that happens in many cases, if you have somebody who never paid into social security, not because they weren't working, they were working, but they were working for a government entity this whole time. So in that case, then their own retirement benefit would be zero. And so they would qualify for this spousal benefit. And so this GPO scales back that spousal benefit, basically. It reduces it by two thirds of the government pension that you're getting. Now there's another chapter in there on the earnings test. And just know that it tells you about how benefits are reduced. There's an adjustment upon reaching your full retirement age. And there's an earnings test for spousal survivor and child benefits. I, I would encourage everybody to read the book about this one because we really wanna dig into when to claim benefits. And we need to know that the decision when to retire is completely separate from the decision of when to claim social security benefits. And then can you tell us a little bit about that and why that is? Yeah, this is one of the most common misconceptions about social security. You'll often hear people, they'll read something about Social Security, the decision of when to file, and maybe the article encourages people to wait until age 70. And then if you look in the comments, there's going to be someone saying, oh, well, I don't want to wait until age 70 ret to retire. And that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about the age at which you file for your benefit. And you can retire and then file for your benefit at a later date. They do not have to coincide. And the opposite can happen too. You can file for your benefit before you retire, although then we do have to worry about the earnings test that, that you were just talking about, Bill. So they're, they're just separate decisions. They don't have to happen at the same time. However, a tricky point is that the SSA, in a lot of their writing, they refer to filing for a retirement benefit as retiring. They do conflate the two terms in a lot of the articles on their website. So it's super important to recognize that that's just a shorthand that they're using, essentially, in their own writing. They talk about retiring and what they really mean is filing for a retirement benefit. And so this is a whole separate thing, but it's important to know that on the social security website, their plain English articles are often summaries that leave out some finer points or kind of a, an attempt to be a plain English explanation, but they're maybe not exactly precise about all of the rules. And they have all of the precise rules elsewhere on their website. But this is one of those examples where they'll say something in a lot of their articles, which isn't quite right. So you make the decision to retire, but it's before your full retirement age. How do you pay for that gap? 
what do you have to have planned for in order to make the gap to your full retirement age or 70 to get your maximum benefit? Yeah, that does mean then there's going to be a period of years, potentially as, as many as eight years, that you're delaying taking your benefit, which means you're going to be spending more from your savings during those years. And a strategy, uh, there's the term for it now, people call it a social security bridge or a social security bridge payment. And the idea is that you allocate a, a piece of your savings towards something very safe, specifically to fund those extra years of spending before social security kicks in. So if for instance, you're planning to retire at age 64 and planning to file for your social security benefit at age 70, you would want to look at what your social security benefit at age 70 is, multiply that by six, because we're talking about six years where you have to pay for this extra amount out of your portfolio. And then that's the amount that you would want to allocate towards something super duper safe. And the most common examples there that people use are tips, treasury inflation protected securities. So you'd buy, for instance, a, a ladder, a six year ladder of tips. I bonds are also a suitable choice because they're super duper safe. Some people use CDs, just a six year CD ladder. That would be fine. Of course, it does expose you to inflation risk, whereas with tips, you don't have inflation risk, but something safe to make sure that you've got those years of spending covered until your social security kicks in. Now you're talking about a ladder, not a tips fund, right? Right. With a tips fund, although there is now one particular exception, BlackRock released a category, a group of, of tips ETFs that work differently. So we'll ignore those for a moment. And for most bond funds, the way that they work is that every year they're constantly buying new bonds, right? So they try to maintain a given average duration or a given average maturity. So for instance, a short-term fund might try to maintain an average maturity of three years. Well, every year, some of the bonds are maturing. And so the portfolio would just evaporate. It would turn into just cash unless they kept buying new bonds. And so every bond fund, except for a handful that work differently on purpose, they are constantly buying new bonds. And so what that means is that any time that you sell a bond fund, you're automatically selling some bonds prior to maturity. And when, because everything that's still in the bond fund at any given time, by definition has not yet matured. So you're selling bonds prior to maturity. And whenever you sell a bond prior to maturity, you don't really know what price you're going to get. Whereas if you buy an individual bond and hold it until maturity, you do know what you're going to get. So if you make a six year ladder of tips, this is how much I've got my, the first tips maturing one year from now, the second one maturing two years from now, and you know exactly how much it will be. Whereas with a tips fund, you don't know how much it's going to be worth one year from now, two years from now, three years from now. We, you just don't know because there's market variation in there. So Becky, how did you bridge the gap? We are funding our gap years from our portfolio. And we, through no uh, prior planning of our own, because back then we didn't know what we were doing, but it's worked out that our investments are pretty well evenly distributed between traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, and a taxable brokerage account. So at the moment, we, we fund our lifestyle out of the taxable brokerage account, and we keep some cash in the money market portion of that account. And we kind of watch, not to market time, but we watch the prices of the, the things that we have in there, the equities and the bonds. And when we need more cash for the next year, then we kind of look at when when it makes sense to sell and, and when it makes sense to convert. So we, we're doing some selling and also some converting between traditional and Roth IRAs. And we, and we, keep, need to understand. we keep our income stack inside the 12% tax bracket. Okay. And what people need to understand is that they're exposing themselves to interest rate risk when they're in a fund and bond prices go down as interest rates go up and vice versa. So the latter makes a lot more sense. Right. And when we just want something that's generally going to be less volatile than stocks in the portfolio, that's what a bond fund is for. But if we want a specific amount of spending available at a specific date, 
that's what we want individual bonds. Okay. Right. Well, we need to dig into when to claim. And you say too, that in order to understand the claiming strategies, you need to understand the claiming decision for singles. Can you take us through that? Yes. So, right. Even for a married couple, you have to start with the less complicated thing. It's just like in physics class where you ignore you ignore friction and you ignore wind resistance and you just simplify away all the complicating stuff at first and start with a simple example. So the scenario of a single person, and so this is someone who is has been single the whole time. So we're not concerned about, they're not a surviving spouse. They're not an ex-spouse of somebody's. They're, they've just been single the whole time. So they can file as early as age 62 or they can wait as, age, as late as age 70 or file anywhere in between. And for every month that they wait, their benefit gets a little bit larger. And if they wait all the way from 62 until 70, their benefit at 70 ultimately would be about 75% more than their benefit would have been at age 62. And so there's trade-offs here, obviously, for you're giving up money when you wait. But what you get in exchange is this higher monthly benefit that is inflation adjusted and backed by the government and will last as long as you do. It'll last the rest of your life. And so the way that we do that math basically. So the way you would do that math in financial planning is to calculate the present value of all of the different options. And essentially what we're just doing here is recognizing that if you wait to file for your benefit, then that means that not only are you not getting some, some benefits right away, but that means that you have to spend from your portfolio, which means you're also giving up some investment returns as well. And so we have to account for that in the math also. And so that's basically the math we're doing is just saying, okay, the longer I wait, the larger the benefit I'll get, but I have to give up some money in the meantime, the income from social security, and I'm going to be giving up some investment returns. So when we do all of that math, how does it work out? And the answer most of the time for a single person is that they should wait not necessarily all the way until age 70, but usually close to age 70. The factors in the decision, their health is a huge factor because the longer you expect to live, the more beneficial it will be to have this social security benefit that lasts your whole life. And so the longer you expect to live, the more sense it makes to wait to file. Another relevant factor is inflation adjusted interest rates. So the higher that tips yields are essentially, the less advantageous it is to wait because the take the money and invest it strategy becomes relatively more attractive. So for instance, right now, it's a little bit less advantageous to wait than it would have been for somebody three years ago making the same decision just because interest rates are higher right now. So the, the take the money and invest it strategy is, is more attractive than it was back then. Still though, for the single person on average, it usually makes sense to wait. And in part, that's simply because life expectancies today are longer on average than they were when the current set of rules was developed. Another reason it's often advantageous to wait is that from a risk point of view, it reduces your risk because in retirement planning, in, in general life, what we're concerned about are the scenarios where we die early. That's the scary scenario. But in retirement planning, it's the opposite. Mm. The scenarios where you live to age 105 mm. are the scary scenarios, right? Because if you retire at 62 and have a heart attack and die at 63, you probably didn't run out of money during your retirement. So it's the live a long time scenarios that are scary in financial retirement planning. And in those scenarios, those are exactly the cases where delaying social security works out best because you'll have this higher benefit that lasts for that whole length of time. And so, we talk about break even points. Is there a rule of thumb on when the break even point is between claiming at 62 and claiming at 70? We do talk about break even points because that's a kind of intuitive way to understand it, right? You're giving up something right now, but you'll get more income later. And so how long do you have to live for that to have worked out? to your advantage. And the break-even points vary based on interest rates, essentially. So if, if we ignore investment returns, if we essentially assume that every dollar in the portfolio exactly matches inflation, but doesn't earn any more or less than that, then the break-even point for a single person is roughly age 80 
a little bit past that, the average life expectancy is for somebody who's already age 62 is longer than that, which is why it usually makes sense to wait. But again, the exact break-even points varies based on whatever interest rates happen to be at the time that you are making the decision. So basically, if you're going to smoke and drink and eat too much and be obese, don't save into your 401k. Take Social Security early because you're not going to need it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the short version, right? And conversely, if you're doing the opposite of those things, it makes even more sense to wait. All right. Well, what a lot of our audience wants to know is there's some complexity, and let's take a high level, a few case studies on when to claim if you're married mm -hmm. and how that works. Yeah. So when we get into a married couple situation, now we have the same retirement benefit math going on, and we have spousal benefits to think about, and we have survivor benefits to think about. So there's just more going on. And the way that it works, essentially, the way that survivor benefits work, the most important thing to know is that when the spouse with the higher earnings record waits to file for their own retirement benefit, it increases the amount that the couple will get for as long as either of the two people is still alive. And the reason for that is that it increases their own retirement benefit, which is relevant for as long as that person is alive. But if the other person, if the lower earner lives longer, their survivor benefit will be increased as a result of that higher earner having waited to file for benefits. So again, just to repeat, because this is the single most important fact about social security planning for a married couple, when the higher earner waits to file for their benefit, it increases the household's income as long as either person is still alive. And because of that, it is usually just mathematically super advantageous for that person to wait all the way until age 70. There can be some exceptions. So for example, if there's minor children or an adult disabled child or something like that, there are exceptions. But most of the time, it's a very good idea for the higher earner to wait until age 70. And then when we look at the other person's decision, the spouse with the lower earnings record, the opposite is true. It's now when that person waits to file, it only increases the household's income for the period of time that both people are still alive, which by definition is a shorter period of time. And the reason for that is that it increases that person's own retirement benefit. But as soon as either person dies, that's no longer relevant because if that lower earner dies, that the retirement benefit goes away. And if the higher earner dies, then that surviving lower earner would start getting a survivor benefit. So the amount of their own retirement benefits is no longer relevant either. So when the lower earner waits, it only increases the household income while both people are still living, which isn't nearly as advantageous. And so it often, not always, but often makes sense for the lower earner to file somewhat earlier. Although there's still, so that's just based on the math of maximizing the amount you're expected to get over your whole lifetimes. There still is the risk point of view, the same point where the scenarios where both people live a long time, those are the financially scary scenarios. And so if you're worried about that scenario and potentially depleting your savings in that scenario, it can still make sense for that lower earner to wait potentially all the way until age 70 to file for benefits. Hmm. Okay. Now there's a lot more that we're going to probably skip over a little bit here because your book is a little bit exhaustive. Another thing in the marital situation is there is an age difference issue between spouses. My wife and I are, for example, a year and a half, two years apart, which would play a role. But what happens when, you know, you marry somebody 10 years younger than you? Yeah, this is important because those two things that we were talking about, the periods of time, it's as long as either person is still alive or as long as both people are still alive. So they're joint life expectancies, essentially. In one case, we're looking at the second to die joint life expectancy. And in the other case, we're looking at the first to die joint life expectancy. And those joint life expectancies are affected by how old your spouse is relative to you. And essentially, the older your spouse is relative to you, the less advantageous it is for you to wait. Because if you just run through this for a second, imagine somebody who at age 62, their spouse is also age 62. Okay, well, their joint life expectancy is whatever it happens to be. But now imagine instead that when spouse A is 62, 
spouse B is age 52. Well, now their joint life expectancy is longer because they've got this one spouse who's much younger. And conversely, if when spouse A is 62, if spouse B is 72, well, now their joint life expectancy is shorter because they've got an older person in the, in the couple. So the older your spouse is relative to you, the shorter the applicable joint life expectancy. And so the less advantageous it is to wait to file for benefits. Yeah, I know Becky wanted to talk about a topic that was applicable to her. I think it was in regards to how Social Security is taxed. Yes, yes. So Social Security is taxed, correct? But it's not 100% taxed. So step us through that. Yes. The, if your income is low enough, none of your Social Security benefits will be taxable. However, once your income reaches a certain threshold, then for every dollar of income beyond that threshold, 50 cents of Social Security becomes taxable. And when I say that, I don't mean that 50 cents of your benefits goes away to taxes. I mean that 50% of it is now included in your taxable income. So for every dollar over that threshold, 50 cents of Social Security is now included in your taxable income. And then you eventually reach a higher threshold. And from that point forward, every additional dollar of income causes 85 cents of Social Security to become taxable. So essentially the more total income that you have, the greater the portion of your Social Security benefits that are taxable. However, the maximum is 85%. No more than 85% of your benefits will be taxable. And an important point here is that those thresholds, unlike most things in our tax code, they aren't indexed to inflation. So just a increasing portion of people find a greater portion of their benefits taxable or 85% taxable year after year after year, because mm-hmm. those, those thresholds are effectively much lower, you know, in, in real terms, they're much lower than they were you know, 15, 20 years ago. And they are fairly low. I think for most people, you're looking at 50 to 85% of your social security being taxed. And then yep. for purposes of, of taxes, like in our case where we're working on some Roth conversions, so we're not paying tax on all of our income, but we need to be aware of how tall our income stack is. So is the 85% that's taxable, does that other 15% not get included in your income stack? Yeah, the 15% that is not taxable, it's not included in your gross income at all. Okay. So it won't show up in, in any of the assorted, all right. you know, the, the million things that are depending on your adjusted <laughs> gross income. It's just not in there. It's not there. Okay. Yeah. So if, for example, I received $10,000 gross in a year from my Social Security, 8500 of it would be taxed. It would be included in my income, but that other 1500 would not be included Correct. in the income, which would allow me another $1,500 of Roth conversions if I wanted to do that. Yeah. A thing that's, so here we're, we're getting into the tax planning side of things, which I think is interesting. So the way this often ends up working for any household where their income is not yet at the point where 85% is taxable, it's important to recognize that their marginal tax rate on additional most sorts of income. So for instance, Roth conversion income is going to be a lot higher than just their tax bracket because each dollar, let's say you're in the 12% tax bracket, each dollar of income is causing that 12 cents of income tax and it's causing 85 cents of social security to become taxable at a 12% rate. Mm. So you're in the 12% tax bracket, but your tax rate's actually more than 20%. You know, these Roth conversions that you might be thinking are happening at 12%, they're actually at 20% and it's a lot less advantageous. But once you reach the point where 85% of your benefits are already taxable, then that effect goes away. So essentially, if you were to create a chart of a person's marginal tax rate, it goes up through this range that additional income is causing social security to become taxable, but then it goes back down. There's a hump basically, Mm -hmm. whereas you might, people typically expect that their tax rates just look like stairs as their income goes up, their tax rate goes up, but no, there's this big hump in the middle of it, basically. Interesting. I didn't know that. (laughs) In other words, you could create you could push yourself from 50% of your social security being taxed into 85% because of the other things that you're doing. Exactly. Great, great point. All right. And the other thing I wanted to bring up really quick is we discovered, this is something we didn't know beforehand is because we are doing wrath conversions, we needed to be paying quarterly income tax. But once my social security started, I actually could choose 
to have taxes withheld out of my Social Security. So real quick, tell us about that. Yeah, so with Social Security, similarly to wage income, so when you work at a job, they have you, when you start the job, fill out a Form W-4, and you can fill out a new Form W-4 at any time. And the idea of Form W-4, when we think about how much tax we owe in a given year, it depends on how much income we have, but it also depends on a lot of other stuff. It depends on, are we married? And if we're married, how much income does our spouse have? And it depends on what various deductions that we have and so on. And so I'm giving background here, but when you work at a job, your employer knows how much they plan to pay you, but they don't know any of that other information. And so that's why we have Form W-4, to give them that other information. So they know about how much they should actually be withholding. And so it's a similar thing with the SSA. You can fill out a Form W-4, it's a kind of specialized one for them. And it basically says, this is how much I want you to be withholding. And that way you make sure that you've paid the appropriate amount over the course of the year, rather than having to manually make estimated tax payments or the third scenario where you don't have withholding and you don't make estimated tax payments and the oops, you owe an underpayment penalty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I happened to look it up before we got online. It's W4V is the form and they give you four choices. You can actually choose how much you want withheld. The choices are 7%, 10, 12, and 22%. So Mike, I wanted to circle back and make sure that sometimes I think I understand all of this. And then, then later I'm like, wait, what, how did that work? But I have to go back and check it again. Cause we were talking about spousal and survivor benefits and how your spousal benefit is half. If you're the lower or the lower wage earner and you're, you qualify for spousal, it's half of your spouse's full retirement age benefit amount Mm -hmm. in general. I know that's not the calculation, but in general that is. But when we're talking about a survivor benefit, and in in my case, like I said, Stephen's waiting until 70, so he's not taking his yet. We're waiting until it gets as big as it will. Mm -hmm. And then if he were to predecease me, let's say I was already taking a spousal benefit, and then he passes away, my benefit then switches to his benefit my my survivor benefit then switches to his full amount. Is that correct? That's often correct. Okay. Yeah. So if he has already reached his full retirement age and he hasn't yet filed for his benefit, and then you also have reached your full retirement age by the time that you file for your survivor benefit, if both of those things are true, then your total benefit would basically be whatever he had been receiving on his date of death. Or if he hadn't yet filed, then it would be whatever he would have received if he had filed on his date of death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you were talking earlier about that these benefits go for as long as either spouse is alive, I just wanted to make sure that I had that straight in my head of that is the full amount, Mm -hmm. not the half Right, exactly. So that's exactly right. So Stephen, when he, if assuming it sounds like he's the higher earner, mm-hmm. the one with the higher earnings history. Definitely. So by him waiting until age 70, he's increasing his retirement benefit and he's increasing the survivor benefit that you would get if that becomes applicable at some point, okay. right? Because whenever he ends up passing away and you switch to a, uh, taking a survivor benefit, your total monthly benefit at that point mm-hmm. would be the amount that he was receiving, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. We're coming to the end of your book, but there's probably, we make mistakes, right? We don't get social security right all the time. And you talk about in chapter 17, do over options. Mm -hmm. Take us through those. There's a a few option number one. So if you filed already, but wish that you hadn't, then you can withdraw your application. However, you can only do that within the first 12 months after having filed. So if you filed three years ago that you can't do it anymore. But within the first 12 months, you can file to withdraw your application, but you also then have to pay back all of the benefits that you received already. So you have to write a lump sum check to the the Social Security Administration. And then once you do that, it's literally as if you hadn't filed at all. So that's one option. Another option, if you've already filed, but maybe wish that you hadn't, you wish that you could have a higher Social Security benefit, but maybe that 12-month window has already closed, 
then when you reach your full retirement age, you can suspend your benefit. They call it voluntary suspension. And then you get what's called delayed retirement credits, which are essentially the same increases that you would get for having waited beyond full retirement age through age 70 to begin with. So in that case, we have this weird case where you have a reduction for having filed early, but then they also add on an increase for having suspended your benefit. And so depending on how early you filed and how many months you suspend, you might end up with something roughly in the ballpark of what your full retirement age benefit would have been. So that's another option. And then on the flip side, if you have a situation where you haven't yet filed and you suddenly realize, gosh, I wish I had filed earlier. And typically that would be the case. So an easy example is imagine a single person, suddenly they get a diagnosis that indicates that their life expectancy is considerably shorter than they thought it was, and they sure wish they had filed earlier, then you can backdate your application. But you can only backdate it by up to six months, and the backdated date cannot be earlier than your full retirement age. So if you're 64, for instance, so you're younger than your full retirement age, you can't backdate it. But if you're 69, and so you're beyond your full retirement age, you could, buy, you could backdate it by up to six months. And then you get a lump sum for those six months, basically. Okay. Well, in sort of a summary wrap up, uh, I want to take us through your rules of thumb on Social Security. So I'm just going to read through them so that we've gone through a lot. It's complicated, even more complicated than we've discussed, but people like rules of thumb. So let's go through them. You've got six. Mm -hmm. And the first one is the longer you expect to live or worry about running out of money, the better is it to hold off on taking benefits. And we've discussed that. Um, number two is for an unmarried person, the break even point is approximately 80.5 years. And if the person lives beyond that point, they will have received more total benefits by waiting till 70. And the average life expectancy of a 62 year old is 83.7. So you need to think about your actuarial life expectancy. If married, number three, the person with a higher primary insurance amount delays taking benefits, this increases the amount received per month as long as either spouse is alive. I find that very important. And then if married, number four, if the spouse with the lower primary insurance amount delays benefits, the amount received per month increases only as long as both spouses are alive. Also really important, you have to look at your health. Joint health, number five, for people born before January 2nd, 1954, there is a way to file a restricted application to receive a period of free benefits. We didn't talk about that. Can you explain that one for us, please? Sure. So we were talking about the deemed filing rules, where if you're eligible for either benefit and you file for one or the other, you're automatically deemed to have filed for the other. And there's an older set of deemed filing rules, but they only apply to anybody born prior to January 2nd, 1954. And so the number of people born prior to that date and not yet age 70 is, is pretty limited because they're going to be turning age 70 in a couple of months. And so for anybody in that window, though, deemed filing doesn't apply if they're already full retirement age. So for people in that window, if they've already reached their full retirement age, which they have, they can file for their spousal benefit while they let their own retirement benefit keep growing until age 70. But again, that's only relevant for I mean, two more months as we're recording this. And as I gather, it won't be relevant at all by the time it airs. <laughs> I guess you're going to update your book on that one. 2022 edition is the most recent. Yeah, the number six and the last rule of thumb that you have here is the higher inflation adjusted return or rate of return you can earn on your investments the better it becomes to take Social Security early. And we talked about that with regards to today's interest rates, right? Exactly. Yep. The higher, the better the rate of return that you can get, the more valuable it is to, to take the money early so that you don't have to spend down your portfolio as quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike, in the conversation in my circle of friends who we are all almost all in our 60s and a few people in their 70s, and I find that that the when to take social security is of course the biggest question for anybody is when to file for it but i hear so many people only looking at the break even analysis 
And I just want to encourage people, that is a piece of data that needs to be looked at, but it is definitely not the only piece that should be looked at, nor is it the most important piece in some cases. there's I know several people who took it at 62, and I think that eventually they're going to regret that decision. But, but the decision of when to take it is definitely an individual decision. Everyone's scenario is different. Everyone has to include their life expectancy, the situation that they're in now with their investments and the size of their portfolio and on and on and on. So I just want to encourage folks to get your book, use it as a reference. They may not be needing to apply for Social Security next month, but it is something definitely that that needs to be understood and thought about. And one of the things that Stephen and I did was we used your online calculator. So would you tell us about that? Sure. OpenSocialSecurity.com. It's open source and it's free. So and when I say free, it's it's not like first you have to put in your email address and then I'll spam you with stuff. No, it's just, it's completely anonymous. It's just free. And the reason I made it open source is A, so that other people could contribute, but also B, so that it's not a black box. Anyone who wants to know any of the math going on behind it can just go look and see the code. And what it does is you put in your dates of birth and spouse A's primary insurance amount or spouse B's primary insurance amount if you're married and any other relevant information. So there's a box at the top of the page that you can check to put in more complicating factors if, for instance, somebody has a government pension like we talked about. And then what the calculator does is it looks at every possible filing age, or if you're married, it looks at every possible combination of filing ages. So for a single person, it's basically looking at 96 different choices because there's an eight-year window times 12 different months per year. And for a married couple, it's looking at 96 times 96 different choices. And it does the math for each of those filing options and using mortality tables that tell us the probability of a given person remaining alive. If they're already alive at age 63, how likely is it that they're alive at age 64 and 65 and so on? And it does that math to see what is the filing age that would be expected to provide the most total income over the person's lifetime or over the couple's lifetimes. Um, Again, after accounting for the fact that if you do take benefits earlier, then you don't have to spend down your portfolio as quickly. So you can, there's the investment return piece to consider as well. So it's it's doing all of that math for you and basically telling you which filing age or combination of filing ages for a couple will maximize that total expected income. I need to emphasize to our audience that this is simple and takes a complex problem and breaks it down to the point where we can understand it. But at the same time, I personally at age 60, 61, or before 62, I'm going to probably engage a a flat fee financial planner to do some of these projections and make sure that my anticipation is right. This is a complex enough problem that I think a second set of eyes on it uh, who understands these issues is really important. Do you know how we would find somebody like that? Are there any websites that may help us find folks that would help us with this decision? Yeah, so if you're looking for flat fee, the Garrett Planning Network, they are financial planners who all work hourly, not ne- not exclusively hourly. Many of them have other models with which they, they charge as well, but they do hourly work. Advice only network or advice only financial, those are things that you can look up. The advice only concept is for financial professionals who provide only advice. So the idea is that they're not going to be trying to upsell you on portfolio, like ongoing portfolio management. So they'll work with you right now on whatever question or questions that you have. And and that's going to be the scope of the engagement rather than intending to bring you in as a permanent long-term client where they're going to provide you a service every single year and charging you every single year. All right, Mike, we want to thank you Mm -hmm. greatly for this. We're going to run it in in its entirety. I have a feeling that our audience will listen to it 10 times, so the downloads will be huge. So thanks again for being with us today, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future because you've got 10, 12, I don't know how many books you've got that are 100 pages or less and go over all elements of finances. And one of them that I think folks will also find important is you talk about what to do if a spouse dies. 
And uh, that's going to happen. And how do you prepare yourself for that? And so that's uh, an important book. And then what to do also if you have more than enough. And we may eventually get to this point where we do. And how do you manage that in sort of a die with zero standpoint, I guess. So there's a, a plethora of books. Where do they find them so that they can start buying them? Just Amazon. Amazon's the best place. Just look up Mike Piper or Social Security Made Simple for that book, for instance. Mm -hmm. And remind us again of your website and your newsletter, because I find your newsletter incredibly valuable. Oblivious Investor is the blog, obliviousinvestor.com. And the calculator calculator that we were just talking about is opensocialsecurity.com. All right. Well, like I said, Becky, we've covered a lot. What do you think? Are people going to get some value out of this episode? Oh, I think so. I, I know for myself, when it came time to make decisions about signing up for Medicare and when to sign up for Social Security, I mean, those are two huge building blocks in people's retirements. They're big decisions. And they are, as you said, Mike, sometimes they're one and done. You make that decision and then you're, you're stuck with it. So you want to make sure that you make a good one and, and that you apply what what is uniquely yours. We were talking about your open social security calculator and Stephen and I used that. But then in addition to that, we had it to add in the fact that his family's life expectancy is pretty short. He has already lived longer than most of the men in the previous generation of his family. My mother, on the other hand, died at 99 and a half. So we've got circumstances that are unique to us yeah. that we had to factor into that. And, and what you've given folks is a great foundation to add in their unique circumstances too, because it is a big decision. And I'm so thankful that you wrote this book and that you've broken this down for us today. And is there, if, if folks want to ask you questions, is there a way that folks can contact you directly? They can email me, mike at obliviousinvestor.com. Okay. Uh-oh, okay. you're going to get a deluge now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're in trouble. Well, Mike is incredibly approachable. He's at a lot of conferences. He speaks a lot. I'd encourage people to see him speak. Find a way to find him. He was at Bogleheads, had some great talks. I, I just, we're privileged to have you on this show. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for being here with us today. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Thanks also to Fritz Bossard, our production engineer, Diana Falk, our social media maven, and Sarah von Sternberg, our show notes author. And thank you to our audience for being with us today. We'll see you next week on Catching Up to Five. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.